Hi, my name is Laura, and welcome to my audio version of the Women's Health Obstetrics EOR Study Guide. The gynecology portion can be found on my channel, but I'll link it below as well. This review is going to follow the PAEA obstetrics portion of the Women's Health End of Rotation Exam topic list, but I'll timestamp all the sections below in case you'd like to skip around. So a quick background. I'm a PA student wrapping up the degree and studying for the pants. Like most PA students, my clinical rotations required a lot of travel time in the car, so I tried to study using various audio resources. There's a ton of great stuff out there, but nothing quite fit the concise EOR exam-based review I was looking for, so I decided to create one. This is the first video series, so we'll see how it goes. Let's start off with a quick review of GPA classification. G is gravida, and it's the total number of times a patient has been pregnant. P is para, and it's the total number of births that occurred after 20 weeks gestation including both viable and non-viable births. Multiple gestations, like twins, count as one here. A is abortus, and this is the total number of pregnancies lost for any reason, including miscarriages and abortions. So for example, G2, P2, would be two pregnancies and two births. G2, P1, A1, would be two pregnancies, one birth, and one miscarriage or abortion. And then G3P2A0 is three total pregnancies and two births, indicating that the patient is currently pregnant. So now onto the topic list. The topic list begins with prenatal care and normal pregnancy, so let's start with the physiology of pregnancy and the changes that occur in the woman's body. This is the longest topic, so I will break it down by organ system, starting with the uterus, baby's home for about nine months. It, of course, increases in size, and this increased capacity is due to hypertrophy, hyperplasia, and mechanical stretching of the smooth muscle. In fact, it can become 20 times larger than it starts out, and it can hold a volume of about 5 liters. During pregnancy, the uterus increases in strength, distensibility, contractile proteins, and number of mitochondria. The uterus can also demonstrate Hagar sign, which is softening of the isthmus, or the lower portion of the uterus that's adjacent to the cervix. Hagar's sign is often present during the first trimester, and it can be assessed on bimanual exam. The cervix itself has some changes too. It forms a mucus plug that seals off the endocervical canal. It also becomes more vascular, which can give it a bluish color and cause significant softening. The cervical softening is called Goodell's sign, and the bluish discoloration of the cervix, as well as the vagina and the vulva, is called Chadwick's sign. And we'll recap all those signs in a minute. So the vagina increases in vascularity as well. The connective tissue loosens to allow for increased distensibility, and physiologic leucoria is common. This is just increased vaginal discharge during pregnancy that is clear or milky in color, and it's odorless. It helps to maintain vaginal pH and protect against bacterial infections to the vaginal canal. So let's quick recap those probable signs of pregnancy. Hagar, Goodell, and Chadwick's sign. Hagar's sign is the softening of the lower one-third of the uterus. Chadwick's sign is the bluish discoloration of the cervix, vagina, and vulva due to increased vascular congestion. I remember it as Chad is a boy's name and blue is stereotypically a boy color, so Chadwick, bluish discoloration. Goodell's sign is the softening of the cervix in pregnancy. I remember it because the cervix is shaped like a donut, which should be good and soft. Goodell, good and soft cervix. Might be a little bit of a stretch. Also, if you remember them in this order, Hagar, Chadwick, Goodell, then their initials spell out HCG, which is the confirmatory test for pregnancy, beta HCG. Okay, the next organ is the placenta. At the very beginning of pregnancy, days one to three after fertilization, the zygote develops within the fallopian tube, and then it enters the uterus on day four. On day five, it becomes a blastocyst as fluid accumulates and it develops poles. The blastocyst has an outer layer of cells that will form the placenta and fetal membranes, and then an inner cell mass that forms the embryo. On day six, the blastocyst implants into the uterine lining. So the placenta then develops where the embryo, or blastocyst, implants. 
and it eventually expands to cover about half of the internal surface of the uterus. It consists of the umbilical cord, membranes, and parenchyma. The placenta also functions as the maternal fetal organ responsible for metabolic functions and nutrient exchange, as well as secretion of hormones and peptides. Recall from the Gyne video that in the normal menstrual cycle, the corpus luteum secretes progesterone and estrogen to maintain the endometrial lining until it deteriorates. Well, in pregnancy, the zygote, or blastocyst, keeps that corpus luteum secreting these hormones until about week 10 to 12 of pregnancy. Then the placenta takes over. In addition to estrogen and progesterone, the placenta also secretes beta-HCG, relaxin, human placental lactogen, thyroid hormone, and corticotropin-releasing hormone. Another common sign of pregnancy is breast enlargement and tenderness. They increase in size, vascularity, blood flow, and nodularity. The areola and nipples become darker in color due to increased melanocyte activity. Progesterone promotes alveolar lobular development, and estrogen increases growth of lactiferous ducts. Secretion of colostrum, which is a nutrient-dense milky fluid that comes in before actual milk production, begins at week 16. The next organ system is the cardiovascular system. During pregnancy, cardiac output increases by 30 to 50 percent, mostly due to a 30 percent increase in stroke volume, as well as an increase in heart rate by about 15 to 20 beats per minute. Remember, cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate. Despite this increased cardiac output, there's still a decrease in blood pressure and systemic vascular resistance due to progesterone-induced vasodilation. Throughout the pregnancy, the heart gets displaced upwards, forwards, and slightly to the left. Mild hypertrophy often occurs, as well as an S3 third heart sound. In later stages of pregnancy, especially the third trimester when the uterus is larger, supine hypotensive syndrome is a concern. And this is just a fancy way of saying that the heavy uterus compresses the vena cava when the pregnant woman is laying on her back. This leads to decreased venous return to the heart and is corrected by having the patient lay in the left lateral recumbent position. So just lay them on their left side. A gravid uterus also increases pressure on the veins that drain blood from the legs and the pelvic organs. So this can lead to dependent edema, varicose veins, and even hemorrhoids. In the hematologic system, there's an increase in blood volume by about a liter and a half. Both plasma and red blood cell volumes increase, but plasma volume increases more, which results in a dilutional anemia or physiologic anemia of pregnancy. So a slightly lower hemoglobin level in pregnant patients is okay and expected. White blood cells also increase, specifically neutrophils, causing a mild neutrophilia, Platelet count actually decreases as pregnancy progresses, but still tends to remain within normal range. Other hematologic changes include increased procoagulant factors, decreased natural anticoagulants, and reduced fibrinolysis. What does this mean? Pregnancy is a hypercoagulable state. More clotting factors and less breakdown of fibrin leads to a higher potential for clot formation, which is great at preventing postpartum hemorrhage, but also something to be aware of for these patients. Next is the respiratory system. Increase in oxygen consumption leads to an increased tidal volume by about 30 to 50 percent, but there's a decrease in total lung capacity by about 5 percent due to displacement of the diaphragm, which is pushed upwards by the growing uterus. So a super quick review of lung volume terminology. Tidal volume is the amount of air that moves in or out of the lungs with a normal breath. Then there's inspiratory and expiratory reserve volumes. After you inhale normally, in a regular breath, if you were to continue to inhale and fill up all that extra space in your lungs, that extra is the inspiratory reserve volume. Okay, now if you were to take a normal breath and exhale normally, then continue to forcibly exhale all the rest of the air you can out of your lungs. All the rest of that air you get out is expiratory reserve volume. 
but you can't possibly exhale all of the air out because it's just not possible. But what's left over after that forceful exhale is residual volume. Residual volume, inspiratory and expiratory reserve volumes, and tidal volume together make up total lung capacity. So while total lung capacity decreases just a little bit, tidal volume, the amount inhaled and exhaled, increases by 30 to 50% in pregnancy. Minute ventilation, defined as the amount inhaled or exhaled per minute, also increases by nearly 50% at term. This is primarily due to that increase in tidal volume, but partially due to an increase in respiratory rate as well. Additionally, pregnancy causes mild respiratory alkalosis. This is a result of progesterone-induced increase in alveolar ventilation, and this respiratory alkalosis is followed by compensatory renal excretion of bicarb, which maintains the arterial pH at normal to slightly alkalotic. So that was a lot, but lastly under the respiratory system, there is increased nasal congestion and nosebleeds due to estrogen-induced edema. And now onto the GI system. Progesterone causes smooth muscle relaxation, delayed gastric emptying, and decreased peristalsis, which leads to heartburn and reflux, constipation, and nausea and vomiting, often referred to as morning sickness, but it doesn't just happen in the morning. It's very common, and a lot of women find that keeping something in their stomach, like eating saltine crackers or something benign throughout the day, helps to alleviate morning sickness but it also typically goes away by mid-pregnancy. There's also a decreased gallbladder emptying associated with pregnancy, and this can lead to an increased risk of cholelithiasis, gallstones, and intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy. Other GI changes include increased saliva production and gums that bleed easily. The urinary system has some obvious changes because the bladder resides underneath the growing uterus. So urinary frequency, nocturia, and stress incontinence are all common during pregnancy. The kidneys also increase in size with an increased glomerular filtration rate, GFR, by about 40 to 50%, and an associated decrease in serum creatinine and BUN. There's increased protein and glucose excretion in the urine as well. Dilation of the urinary collecting system is also common, resulting in physiologic hydronephrosis and or hydroureter in up to 80% of pregnant patients. This dilated collecting system can hold 200 to 300 milliliters of urine, and so it can act as a reservoir for bacteria, which accounts for the increased risk of pyelonephritis during pregnancy. In addition, pregnant patients have higher rates of bacteriuria and UTIs, which is one of the reasons they are screened with urinalysis throughout their pregnancy. Next is the integumentary system. Skin hyperpigmentation during pregnancy is a result of estrogen and increased melanocyte activity. This hyperpigmentation can include melasma, the brown patchy mask of pregnancy on the face, can include linea nigra, which is a dark vertical line that runs down the middle of the abdomen, and it can include darkening of the nipples, areola, and the vulva. Stretch marks occur due to a decrease in connective tissue strength, secondary to increased adrenal steroid levels, and estrogen-induced vascular permeability leads to spider nevi, angiomas, and palmar erythema. Now the musculoskeletal system. Abdominal distension in the enlarged uterus can cause a shift in the patient's center of gravity, which can lead to lordosis of the lumbar spine. The growing uterus can also cause separation of the abdominal rectus muscles, which is a condition called diastasis recti. Additionally, some pregnant females adopt a waddling gait. This is because increased progesterone and relaxin hormones cause increased joint mobility. This facilitates widening of the pubic symphysis, accommodation of the fetus into the pelvis, and high bone turnover or remodeling. Endocrine changes are next. The size of the pituitary gland increases in pregnancy due to proliferation of lactotroph cells. 
There is an increase in parathyroid hormone, which stimulates release of calcium by the bones, absorption of calcium from the food, and conservation by the kidneys in order to meet the calcium needs of the developing fetal skeleton. Pregnancy also causes a physiologic hypercortisolism, increased serum cortisol, as a result of increased corticotropin releasing hormone. Pregnancy is considered a diabetogenic state, as there's an increased need for glucose as well as insulin production. The thyroid gland enlarges with an increase in total T3 and T4 and a slight decrease in TSH. Finally, there are changes in reproductive hormones, HCG from the placenta, estrogen and progesterone from the corpus luteum and then the placenta, suppressed FSH and LH due to that increased estrogen and progesterone, and decreased oxytocin levels during pregnancy before a spike in oxytocin that comes with labor. Nutritional needs change with pregnancy as well. An additional 300 calories per day is recommended for a total weight gain of 25 to 35 pounds throughout the pregnancy. Folic acid is needed prior to pregnancy to decrease the risk of neural tube defects and during the pregnancy for red blood cell synthesis and placental fetal growth. Iron supplementation supports the increased red blood cell synthesis, increased protein supports tissue growth, and calcium is important during both pregnancy and lactation. And that wraps up the physiology of pregnancy topic. The next topic is fetal position and size, which becomes very important the closer they get to labor and delivery. Fetal head size is the most critical. If the fetal head is too big for the pelvic opening, called cephalopelvic disproportion, there's a risk of labor dystocia, difficult or obstructed labor, and a C-section might be necessary. Similarly, macrosomia, when the baby is much larger than average, generally greater than 9 pounds, there is increased risk of shoulder dystocia and birth injuries. Fetal attitude is the relationship of fetal parts to one another. Ideally, the baby will be in full flexion, chin to chest, extremities flexed, rounded back, with the smallest diameter of the head at the maternal pelvic inlet. Fetal lie is the relationship of the baby's spine to mom's spine, termed cephalocaudal axis. The ideal fetal lie is longitudinal, when the fetal spine is parallel to mom's. A transverse fetal lie is when the fetal spine is perpendicular to mom's, and oblique is when baby is at a slight angle. So we want to see a longitudinal lie prior to labor and delivery. Fetal presentation refers to which part of the baby enters the pelvic inlet first. Baby should be head first, a cephalic presentation, and ideally vertex with fetal chin to chest. Vertex is the most common cephalic presentation and is optimal for delivery, but brow or face presentations are possible too. If the baby is not head first, this is called a breech presentation. Breech can mean bottom first, shoulder first, extremity, etc. And we'll go over this a little more in depth in the complication section, but basically remember that baby should ideally be head down, face down, with a longitudinal lie. The next topic is normal labor and delivery. There are three main stages of labor. Stage one is the onset of labor until full dilation of the cervix to 10 centimeters. Stage two is from full dilation until the delivery of the baby. And stage three is postpartum until delivery of the placenta. So let's go through each stage in more depth. Stage one, as we said, is the time from onset of labor to complete cervical dilation at 10 centimeters. But what defines the onset of labor? Per the textbook, it's defined as regular painful contractions that result in progressive cervical effacement and dilation. But in practice, it's not always easy for a pregnant patient to know whether the contractions she's feeling are true labor or false labor, also called Braxton Hicks contractions. These Braxton Hicks contractions can occur at any point during the pregnancy, but are more common in the later half. They tend to be more mild and irregular or intermittent and do not produce any cervical changes. Sometimes walking can decrease the pain. True labor contractions are regular, increase in frequency and duration, and intensity, with radiation to the low back and abdomen, and they produce cervical changes. Other signs of true labor onset include lightening, when the fetal head descends into the pelvis, giving the sensation that the baby has become lighter or has dropped. 
ruptured membranes, which is a sudden gush or constant leakage of fluid, described by patients saying their water broke. And bloody show or passage of blood-tinged cervical mucus when the cervix begins to thin. These are signs that a patient is approaching labor. The first stage of labor is broken down into the early or latent phase and the active phase. The latent phase is characterized by gradual cervical change, whereas the active phase is characterized by more rapid change. And the transition from latent to active normally happens around 5 centimeters dilation, give or take. The latent phase typically lasts 8 to 12 hours with mild contractions every 5 to 30 minutes for about a 30 second duration. The cervix is somewhere between 0 and 30% effaced or thinned out, and spontaneous rupture of membranes often happens during this phase. The active phase is a little faster, lasting 3 to 5 hours on average, with contractions every 3 to 5 minutes, for a longer duration around 1 minute or more. Cervical effacement is around 80%, and the fetus begins to descend. As labor transitions into the second stage, sometimes called the transition phase of stage one, contractions become intense every minute or two, lasting 60 to 90 seconds with a fully dilated and effaced cervix. Once the cervix is fully dilated to 10 centimeters, stage two of labor begins. This can be thought of as the pushing stage. The baby is pushed through the pelvis as determined by the three P's, power, passenger, and passage. Power refers to the frequency, duration, and intensity of contractions. Passenger refers to the fetus, the baby's size and position, which we discussed in the previous topic. We want baby to be head down, face down. And passage refers to the baby's route through the maternal pelvis. There are seven cardinal movements of labor to know. First is engagement, when the fetal head reaches the pelvic inlet. Second is descent, when the baby progresses from the pelvic inlet to the pelvic outlet to crowning at the vaginal opening. Third is flexion, the fetal chin presses against their chest as the head meets resistance from the maternal pelvic floor. Fourth is internal rotation, fetal shoulders internally rotate so that the widest part of the shoulders are in line with the widest part of the maternal pelvic inlet. Fifth is extension, when the fetal head passes under the pubic symphysis and emerges from the vagina. Sixth is external rotation, when the baby's head turns to align again with the rest of its body. And seven, the last movement is expulsion. The anterior shoulder slips under the pubic symphysis, followed by the posterior shoulder, and then the rest of the body. So the cardinal movements of labor, again, are engagement, descent, flexion, internal rotation, extension, external rotation, and expulsion. And this marks the end of the second stage of labor. The third stage of labor begins after the delivery of the infant and is complete after the delivery of the placenta. This is usually within 30 minutes of the delivery of the infant, but 5 minutes is the average. Essentially what happens is the uterus begins to contract firmly, the placenta separates from the uterine wall, sometimes there's a flow of blood, and then expulsion of the placenta. Finally, the period 1-2 to two hours after delivery, when uterine involution is initiated and the mother is assessed for complications, is sometimes called the fourth stage of labor. Once baby is delivered, the APGAR score is a way to quickly assess the health of the newborn. It's done at 1 minute and 5 minutes after delivery, and then again 5 minutes later if it remains abnormal. APGAR stands for Appearance, Pulse, Grimace, Activity, and Respiration. A newborn scores between 0 and 2 points in each of these categories, so their total APGAR score will be between 0 and 10. Let's go over the scoring. A newborn scores two in appearance if they are pink all over, one in appearance if they have a pink core but cyanotic extremities, and zero in appearance if they are blue or gray or pale all over. A newborn scores two in pulse if their pulse is over 100, one in pulse if it's under 100 beats per minute, and zero in pulse if they are pulseless. A newborn scores two in grimace if they pull away, sneeze, or cough. 
one in Grimace if they have feeble reflexes, and zero in Grimace if they show no response to stimulation. A newborn scores two in activity if they flex their arms and legs and resist extension, one in activity if they show some flexion, and zero in activity if they show no muscle tone. And finally, a newborn scores two in respiration if they have a strong cry, one in respiration if they have weak or irregular breathing, and zero in respiration if they are apneic. So newborns almost never come out scoring 10 on the APGAR scale. Their heart and lungs are still adjusting to the whole breathing air thing, so it's really used for trending. We want to see the APGAR score increase from minute 1 to minute 5. That being said, a score of 7 or higher is normal and typically doesn't require any interventions. 3 or less is critically low and the newborn requires resuscitation. In between these, between 3 and 7, the score is low but take into consideration trending. If their 1 minute APGAR is 5 but they pinked up with some stimulation or blow by oxygen, and their 5 minute score is 8, then they're trending upwards. Now let's back up a little bit to prenatal care. This one's a doozy because it involves all the evaluations and screening tests and ultrasounds and blood work done at each appointment during each trimester of the pregnancy. I'm going to try to make it easy by going chronologically from the first prenatal visit right up until delivery. So here's the typical schedule for prenatal care visits. From weeks 4 through 28 of the pregnancy, beginning whenever they find out that they're pregnant, the patient has an appointment every four weeks. From weeks 28 to 36 of the pregnancy, the patient has an appointment every two weeks. By week 36 of the pregnancy, the patient starts coming in every week until delivery. So at the very first prenatal visit, confirmation of the pregnancy should be done by beta-HCG in a blood or urine sample. A full history and physical exam should be done as well, including a pap smear if they're due for one. It's particularly important to get baseline weight and blood pressure measurements to trend throughout the pregnancy, and fundal height should be measured if appropriate. A blood draw should be done at the very first prenatal visit for the following labs. CBC, blood type and RH factor, blood glucose, HBSAG for hepatitis B, HIV and syphilis screening, rubella titer, screening for sickle cell and cystic fibrosis. A urinalysis should also be done to assess for glucose and protein in the urine, and the patient should be prescribed or recommended a prenatal vitamin at the first visit as well. We can also predict the estimated date of delivery at this first visit using Nagel's rule. It's calculated as the first day of the last menstrual period plus seven days minus three months. So if the first day of the patient's last menstrual cycle was December 13th, 2021, We add seven days, making it December 20th, and subtract three months, making it September 20th. Then don't forget to add the year, so the estimated date of delivery would be September 20th, 2022. While we should know this calculation for the exam, the most accurate estimation of gestational age is going to be the crown rump length measured from the first trimester ultrasound. So at every subsequent prenatal visit throughout the entire pregnancy, we assess weight, blood pressure, urinalysis, fundal height, fetal heart rate by Doppler, and a pelvic exam if indicated. A quick note here on fundal height. At 12 weeks gestation, the fundus of the uterus should be palpable at the pubic symphysis. At 16 weeks, it's midway between the symphysis and the umbilicus, And at 20 weeks, the fundus is at the umbilicus. And then after 20 weeks gestation, the fundal height in centimeters corresponds to the week of gestation. For example, at 30 weeks gestation, you should measure a fundal height of 30 centimeters. All right, back to our chronology. During the first trimester, weeks 1 through 12, the patient is only coming in once a month, so a number of things get done at each visit. The first trimester ultrasound, if it wasn't done at the first prenatal visit, should be ordered. This will confirm intrauterine pregnancy. It'll estimate gestational age, give us a heads up to potential complications, and the fetal heartbeat can be heard by ultrasound by six weeks. 
Screening tests for Down syndrome can be done around weeks 11 to 14 by assessing beta-HCG and pregnancy-associated plasma protein A in the blood, combined with nuchal translucency measured on the ultrasound. Down syndrome is associated with higher-than-expected beta-HCG. Lower pregnancy-associated plasma protein A and increased nuchal translucency. Cell-free fetal DNA screening can be done as well. This is non-invasive and analyzes fetal DNA in the mother's blood in order to screen for trisomy 13, trisomy 18 or Edwards syndrome, and trisomy 21 or Down syndrome. Any positive test results should be confirmed by chorionic villus sampling or amniocentesis. Chorionic villus sampling can be done in weeks 10 through 13 and is done by collecting a placental tissue sample to test for chromosomal and genetic abnormalities. There are a number of risks and complications associated with chorionic villus sampling, including miscarriage, amniotic fluid leakage, transmission of infection like HIV, and maternal alloimmunization, which is related to Rh factor in the blood. Because of these serious risks, it's commonly offered to patients who have a reason for prenatal genetic diagnosis, like maternal age over 35 years, a previous child with chromosomal or genetic abnormality, parent carrier of a chromosomal or genetic disorder, congenital anomaly on the first trimester ultrasound exam, and to confirm the cell-free fetal DNA screening like we just talked about. During the second trimester, weeks 13 through 27, the patient is still only coming in once a month. At every visit, we are still assessing weight, BP, urinalysis, fundal height, and fetal heart rate by Doppler. But there are a lot of other screening tests that need to get done or be offered during the second trimester. The triple screen is offered between weeks 15 through 20, and this assesses alpha fetoprotein, or AFP, beta-HCG, and estradiol. It can detect neural tube defects and trisomies. Similarly, a quadruple screen does the same thing, but it includes inhibin A, so it's more accurate and more commonly used. So let's go over some common results for these tests. Down syndrome, or trisomy 21 test results, show decreased AFP, increased beta-HCG, often twice as high as normal, decreased estradiol, and increased inhibin A. Edwards syndrome, or trisomy 18 test results, show decreased AFP, beta-HCG, and estradiol. All are decreased in Edwards, except for inhibin A, which can be normal. Open neural tube defects like spina bifida and abdominal wall defects have high AFP. High AFP can also be normal in multiple gestations, though, like with twins. Um, And ultrasound is actually preferred to diagnose neural tube defects. Amniocentesis is another test that can be offered in the second trimester. It's a collection of a sample of amniotic fluid that can be done in weeks 15 through 20. Amniocentesis is similar to chorionic villus sampling and has the same indications like maternal age over 35, abnormal screening tests or ultrasound, or prior child with chromosomal abnormality. The difference is that chorionic villus sampling is offered earlier, at the end of the first trimester, and amniocentesis is later, at the beginning of the second trimester, but amniocentesis can detect more abnormalities, specifically neural tube defects. There's also an ultrasound in the second trimester, referred to as the anatomy scan. This is the one that everyone looks forward to because it reveals the sex of the baby. A lot of measurements are taken at this ultrasound to assess fetal anatomy and to detect any abnormalities. It also screens for short maternal cervix length, which has an increased risk of preterm birth. And the last major second trimester screening test is the glucose challenge test, also called the one-hour glucose test. This test is administered between weeks 24 and 28, or earlier if the patient has significant risk factors for diabetes. During the test, the patient drinks a sugary soda-like beverage with 50 grams of glucose, and then one hour later their blood sugar is measured. If this test is abnormal, meaning the blood sugar is too high, it's followed up with a 75-gram, two-hour glucose tolerance test, but more on this later. Finally, lab work is reassessed for anemia and RH factor in the second trimester. Remember, pregnancy has an associated physiologic dilutional anemia, so we expect lower values for hemoglobin and hematocrit, but still need to make sure that there's no severe anemia. 
Also, iron and folate deficiencies can result in anemia due to the increased iron and folate requirements of pregnancy. We also recheck antibody titers in the blood at this time, since Rh factor was initially checked the very first visit. If the mother's Rh negative, she gets the first anti-D immune globulin injection, also called a Rogam shot, at 28 weeks. Then the second Rogam injection is within 72 hours of delivery. Now we're into the third trimester, week 28 until delivery. The patient is coming in every two weeks until week 36 of pregnancy, and then they come in weekly. We're still assessing weight, BP, urinalysis, fundal height, fetal heart rate by Doppler, and pelvic exam if indicated. We also reassess for anemia and STIs in the third trimester. An ultrasound might be done if the patient is high risk or if there were any previous abnormalities, but most pregnancies don't require another ultrasound in the third trimester. During weeks 35 through 37, the patient gets swabbed for group B strep. This is a vaginal rectal culture, so the swab goes from the vagina to the anus, and if positive, the mother simply gets IV antibiotics during labor to prevent group B strep in the newborn. Other tests that might be performed during the third trimester include a non-stress test or even a full biophysical profile. These assess fetal well-being and might be done more often in high-risk patients, especially in the case of gestational hypertension or diabetes, post-term pregnancy, interuterine growth restriction, increased maternal age, previous pregnancy complications, or to assess decreased fetal movement. Some providers will also do them routinely. A non-stress test, also called an NST, is continuous electronic monitoring of fetal heart rate combined with monitoring fetal movement. Heart rate acceleration in response to fetal movement is a sign of a healthy baby. A normal baseline fetal heart rate should be between 120 to 160 beats per minute. A healthy reactive NST has two or more accelerations in a 20-minute period, and an acceleration is defined as an increase in heart rate by 15 or more beats per minute, lasting at least 15 seconds. If there are not at least two accelerations, or if there are decelerations, it's considered a non-reactive NST and could indicate fetal distress. Or it could just mean that baby is sleeping. So vibroacoustic stimulation can be done and then a repeat NST, or a full biophysical profile. A biophysical profile combines an ultrasound with a non-stress test to measure five variables, fetal breathing, fetal heart tones, fetal movement, amniotic fluid levels, and the NST. The last thing we need to go over is interpretation of NSTs and their etiologies, since you might see them on the exam. The acronym to use is VEAL-CHOP. VEAL stands for Variable Decelerations, Early Decelerations, Accelerations, and Late Decelerations. These are all the possible results of the NST. CHOP refers to the causes of these results. So CHOP stands for Cord Compression, Head Compression, O is OK, and P is Placental Insufficiency. So the V in veal corresponds to the C in chop, and the E corresponds to H, and so on. Variable decelerations on NST are caused by cord compression, often the baby's head on their umbilical cord. Early decelerations are caused by head compression, like the baby's head descending into the pelvis. Accelerations are okay, meaning they're a normal healthy sign. And late decelerations, more worrisome, are caused by placental insufficiency. All right, good work. We've finished the prenatal care topic. The last topic under normal pregnancy is multiple gestations. Twins occur in one out of every 80 births, about a 3% incidence in the U.S. This is projected to rise, though, as the use of fertility treatments increases. So let's start with some terminology. Monozygotic refers to multiple fetuses formed by the splitting of a single zygote, or to say it another way, formed from the fertilization of one egg. Monozygotic is the same thing as identical twins. Dizygotic refers to multiple fetuses produced by two different zygotes, or formed by the fertilization of two eggs by two different sperm. Dizygotic is the same thing as fraternal twins. Multiple gestational pregnancies are normally diagnosed at the first screening ultrasound, but other clues include fundal height, 
extra fetal heart tones, and elevated maternal alpha fetal protein, AFP. Once diagnosed, prenatal visits should occur more frequently to monitor and screen for complications. The most common maternal complications include preterm labor, spontaneous abortion, preeclampsia, and anemia. Fetal complications can include intrauterine growth restriction, placental abnormalities, breech presentation, and umbilical cord prolapse. Multiple gestations are designated as high risk and are often scheduled for induction or even C-section early but after 30 weeks. That concludes the normal pregnancy section, and the next one is pregnancy complications, starting with abortion. Spontaneous abortion, or miscarriage, is an expulsion of all or part of the products of conception before 20 weeks gestation. The incidence of spontaneous abortion is at least 15-20% to of all pregnancies, and 80% of those occur in the first three months. By far, the most common etiology is fetal chromosomal abnormalities, which are responsible for 50% of all spontaneous abortions. Other risk factors include smoking, maternal infection, uterine defects, endocrine abnormalities, malnutrition, trauma, and drug use. If spontaneous abortion is suspected, order an ultrasound to assess fetal viability, quantitative beta-HCG, CBC, blood type, and antibody screen to determine if the patient needs a Rogam injection. Treatment is based on what type of spontaneous abortion is occurring. Threatened abortion means that the pregnancy might be viable or a miscarriage might occur. It presents with bloody vaginal discharge, either spotting or profuse bleeding, and possible contractions, but with a closed cervix and no products of conception or tissue expelled from the uterus at this point. Treatment is supportive, rest at home, monitor beta-HCG to see if it's doubling, and threatened abortion occurs before 20 weeks. Actually, all of these occur before 20 weeks. Inevitable abortion means that the pregnancy is not salvageable. It presents with moderate bleeding for more than a week, moderate to severe cramping, progressive cervical dilation more than 3 centimeters, but no fetal tissue expelled at this point. Treatment for inevitable abortion is a suction curatage in the first trimester or a dilation and evacuation in the second trimester. Also, give Rogam if mom is Rh negative. An incomplete abortion is also not a salvageable pregnancy. It presents with heavy bleeding, moderate to severe cramping, a boggy uterus, dilated cervix, some tissue expelled, and some still retained. Treatment for an incomplete abortion is a DNC, dilation and curatage, in the first trimester, or a dilation and evacuation in the second trimester. Or the patient may just be allowed to continue expelling tissue if they're progressing sufficiently. Pitocin can also be given, and a Rogam shot should be given if indicated. Complete abortion means complete passage of all products of conception from the uterus. At this point, cramps and bleeding have usually subsided and the cervix is closed again. The only treatment at this point is a Rogam shot if the mother is Rh negative. A missed abortion is when fetal demise has occurred, but all of the tissue is still retained in the uterus. Symptoms of pregnancy loss might be present, as well as brown discharge, but the cervix is still closed. Treatment for missed abortion is similar to an incomplete abortion. The patient gets a DNC in the first trimester or a dilation and evacuation in the second trimester, as well as misoprostol, which is a prostaglandin that causes uterine contractions. A septic abortion occurs when retained fetal tissue becomes infected. Symptoms include foul brownish discharge, fever and chills, spotting or heavy bleeding, uterine tenderness, cervical motion tenderness, but with a closed cervix, and some or all of the products of conception are retained. Treatment is a dilation and evacuation to remove the infected tissue, plus broad-spectrum antibiotics. In severe cases, a hysterectomy might be necessary. The last term to know here is recurrent spontaneous abortions, and this is three or more consecutive pregnancy losses. The next topic is incompetent cervix, which is actually a cause of recurrent second trimester miscarriages. So incompetent cervix, or cervical insufficiency, is defined as a spontaneous premature dilation or shortening of the cervix during the second trimester, or sometimes the early third trimester. It presents with recurrent miscarriages. Risk factors include a history of cervical insufficiency, surgery, 
injury, or anatomic abnormalities. A pelvic exam will show painless dilation greater than 2 centimeters, as well as effacement of the cervix. Bleeding or discharge may be present, as well as minimal contractions. Incompetent cervix is diagnosed with a transvaginal ultrasound. Treatment is a cervical cerclage, which is basically just a suture to strengthen the cervix, and this is placed at 12 to 14 weeks gestation. It's then removed at 36 to 38 weeks to allow for delivery. The next topic is placenta previa. This is a condition in which the placenta implanted very low in the uterus and is covering part or all of the cervix. This occurs in about 1 in 200 pregnancies. It can be complete, covering the entire cervical os, partial, covering a portion of it, or marginal, meaning that it's within 2 centimeters of the cervical os. Placenta previa is characterized by sudden onset of painless third trimester bleeding. There is no pain or tenderness associated with this bleeding. There is usually no fetal distress either. Risk factors include increasing age, multiple gestation, and smoking. Diagnosis is made by pelvic ultrasound to locate the placenta, and sometimes diagnosis is already known prior to any bleeding episodes due to routine ultrasounds. Also, do not perform a pelvic exam in these patients as it can provoke hemorrhage if palpated. Treatment is modified bed rest, so no vigorous activity, as well as pelvic rest, so no intercourse. Tocolytics might be used to inhibit uterine contractions and prevent preterm labor. Steroids can be given to aid fetal lung maturity in case delivery occurs early, and a C-section is a preferred route of delivery since the placenta is literally blocking baby's exit. Vasa previa is a similar condition in which fetal vessels lie over the cervical os. Rupture of membranes causes painless vaginal bleeding as well as fetal bradycardia, indicating fetal distress. So presentation is third trimester painless bleeding and fetal bradycardia. Treatment is an immediate C-section. Placenta previa and placental abruption are the two most common causes of third trimester bleeding. So let's go over placental abruption now. It's defined as the premature separation of some or all of the placenta from the uterine wall after 20 weeks, resulting in painful hemorrhage. Placental abruption presents with third trimester bleeding, often dark red, and often severe abdominal pain with uterine contractions. The uterus can be rigid, abdominal pain might extend to the back, and the patient might present with symptoms of shock, although it's possible to be asymptomatic as well. Additionally, fetal bradycardia indicates fetal distress because baby's oxygen supply is being disrupted. Risk factors include trauma, hypertension, preeclampsia, multiple gestations, cocaine, and alcohol abuse. The diagnosis is always clinical and, again, do not perform a pelvic exam. Ultrasound might show retroplacental blood collection but is generally not that helpful. Other signs include fetal bradycardia and uterine activity. Treatment is hospitalization and immediate delivery, preferably C-section. Corticosteroids can be given to aid fetal lung maturity, if indicated, and type and screen is indicated in the case the mother might need blood products. Additionally, as many as 10% of cases might develop DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation. On to RH incompatibility. So remember in the first prenatal visit, the mother is assessed for blood type and RH factor? This is done to assess the risk of RH alloimmunization. If an RH negative mother, meaning blood types like O negative or A negative, carries an RH positive fetus and is exposed to fetal blood during vaginal delivery, C-section, placental abruption, etc., then RH alloimmunization can occur. The mixing of blood prompts the mother's immune system to make anti-RH immunoglobulin G antibodies against baby's blood. This won't affect the first pregnancy, but it will affect subsequent pregnancies. So if she carries another RH-positive baby, the antibodies can cross the placenta and attack fetal red blood cells, resulting in hemolysis of those fetal cells. This causes neonate hemolytic disease. So a subsequent newborn that is RH-positive can develop hemolytic anemia, jaundice, kernicterus, hepatosplenomegaly, congestive heart failure, and fetal hydrops. If a mother is RH negative and the father is RH positive, then there is a 50% chance that the baby will be RH positive. Prevention is done by assessing maternal blood type during prenatal care. 
And if she is Rh negative, treatment is anti-D immune globulin, also called a Rogam injection, at 28 weeks, and then again within 72 hours of delivery, as well as during any uterine bleeding that might occur during the pregnancy. Gestational hypertension, or pregnancy-induced hypertension, is high blood pressure after 20 weeks gestation that resolves 12 weeks postpartum. Clinically, this is asymptomatic, but presents with elevated blood pressure greater than 140 over 90, that is, systolic greater than 140 and or diastolic greater than 90. Also, there is no proteinuria, no protein in the urine. If there is, that becomes another condition, preeclampsia. So gestational hypertension is just elevated blood pressure, and it's thought to be due to arteriolar vasoconstriction. If severe hypertension is present, meaning systolic greater than 160 and or diastolic greater than 110, then hydralazine or labetalol should be given. If the hypertension isn't in the severe range, then meds might not be given, but often extra surveillance of the pregnancy is recommended, like non-stress tests and additional prenatal appointments. Patients might also have chronic hypertension during pregnancy, like an already hypertensive patient becoming pregnant or a patient with previously undiagnosed hypertension. This can present as blood pressure greater than 140 over 90 prior to 20 weeks gestation, and that persists longer than six weeks postpartum. This patient might be asymptomatic or they might get headaches or visual symptoms if it's severe. Again, this diagnosis does not involve any protein in the urine. For patients with chronic hypertension during pregnancy, if blood pressure is greater than 150 over 110, treatment is methyl dopa, but you can also use labetalol, hydralazine, and nifedipine. So we said that gestational hypertension does not involve proteinuria. If there is hypertension with proteinuria, the diagnosis is either preeclampsia or eclampsia. So let's go over those now. Preeclampsia is a classic triad of hypertension and proteinuria, with or without edema, after 20 weeks gestation. If these symptoms occur earlier than 20 weeks, it could be a sign of multiple gestation or a molar pregnancy. And we'll go over that later. Other clinical manifestations of preeclampsia include symptoms of hypertension like headaches, fetal growth restriction, and the edema of the face, feet, and hands. Mild preeclampsia is defined by blood pressure greater than 140 over 90 and protein urea greater than 300 milligrams or more than plus one on a urine dipstick. The only cure for preeclampsia is delivery. So for mild preeclampsia, delivery should occur at 37 weeks or later. Ultimately, the decision to induce depends on the stage of the pregnancy and the severity of the disease. Steroids can also be given to help develop fetal lungs, especially if it's less than 34 weeks gestation. Severe preeclampsia is defined by a blood pressure greater than 160 over 110 and proteinuria greater than 5 grams or a plus 3 on a urine dipstick. The patient may also have oliguria or reduced urine output, visual changes, pulmonary edema, as well as thrombocytopenia with or without DIC disseminated intravascular coagulation. Treatment is prompt delivery plus hospitalization to administer magnesium sulfate, which is a medication used to prevent seizures in eclamptic and preeclamptic patients. Blood pressure meds can also be given like hydralazine, labetalol, and nifedipine. HELP syndrome, spelled H-E-L-L-P, is also worth mentioning here. It's believed to be a severe form of preeclampsia, and it stands for hemolytic anemia, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets. Symptoms are similar to preeclampsia, and again, the only cure is delivery. Now on to eclampsia. The distinguishing feature between preeclampsia and eclampsia is the onset of seizures. So eclampsia is defined as hypertension and proteinuria plus seizures or coma. And these are going to be tonic-clonic grand mal type seizures with a postictal state. The condition is life-threatening for both mom and baby, and again, the only treatment is delivery. These patients should be hospitalized with mag sulfate to prevent the seizures, and then induced once they're stabilized. Another common condition that can occur during pregnancy is gestational diabetes. Gestational diabetes is glucose intolerance, or diabetes mellitus, that is only present during pregnancy and subsides postpartum. 
However, those who develop it while pregnant are at a higher risk of developing type 2 diabetes later on in life. So risk factors include family or prior history of gestational diabetes, spontaneous abortion, history of an infant greater than 4 kilograms at birth, multiple gestations, and obesity. Gestational diabetes is caused by a surge of hormones, including growth hormone, corticotropin-releasing hormone, cortisol, and human placental lactogen, which promote a state of insulin sensitivity or resistance in the mother. This increases blood glucose, which is readily transported across the placenta to promote fetal growth. Pregnant women normally compensate for these changes by hyperplasia of pancreatic beta cells and increased insulin secretion. However, in gestational diabetes, there's a beta cell dysfunction, so the pancreas is unable to compensate. Typically, this is screened for by a random blood glucose on the very first prenatal visit, which assesses pre-existing diabetes, and then again around 24 to 28 weeks with the 50-gram oral glucose challenge test. If blood glucose is 140 or higher after one hour, then a confirmatory three-hour 100-gram glucose tolerance test is done. This is the gold standard for diagnosing gestational diabetes. This test is done in the morning after an overnight fast, and it is considered positive if fasting blood glucose is above 95, or if it's higher than 180 after one hour, higher than 155 after two hours, or higher than 140 after three hours. In most cases of gestational diabetes, the patient is asymptomatic. The most common complication is macrosomia, but there is a long list of other complications, including fetal demise, congenital malformation, premature labor, neonatal hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia, shoulder dystocia, birth trauma, hyperbilirubinemia, preeclampsia, and placental abruption. Additionally, mothers should be screened six weeks postpartum for diabetes, as they have a high chance of developing type 2 diabetes later, as well as recurrent gestational diabetes with subsequent pregnancies. Treatment includes monitoring blood glucose with daily finger sticks at night and after each meal, along with nutrition and exercise modifications. If fasting blood glucose is still greater than 105 or a two-hour postprandial glucose is greater than 120, then insulin should be considered. Insulin is the treatment of choice in pregnancy because it does not cross the placenta. Gliburide is the only oral option that doesn't cross the placenta, but it carries a higher risk of eclampsia. Weekly fetal heart rate monitoring should also be considered. Labor induction at 38 weeks is encouraged if the diabetes is uncontrolled or the child has macrosomia, meaning a size greater than 4 to 4.5 kilograms. C-section should also be considered in this case. Finally, after delivery, monitor baby for hypoglycemia, shoulder dystocia, cardiac abnormalities, and respiratory distress. Gestational trophoblastic disease includes an array of diseases associated with abnormal placental trophoblastic tissue. Some are benign proliferation of placental cells and others are malignant. There are four main types to know for the exam. Molar pregnancy, invasive mole, choriocarcinoma, and placental site trophoblastic tumor. We'll go over each of these in a minute. Risk factors include extremes in maternal age, so younger than 20 or older than 35, and previous molar pregnancies. Common clinical manifestations can include beta-HCG being much higher than expected, a size-date discrepancy of the uterus, hyperemesis, painless vaginal bleeding early on in the pregnancy, and preeclampsia before 20 weeks. Diagnosis is made by a significantly elevated beta-HCG, like more than 100,000, and very low alpha-fetoprotein, AFP. Ultrasound should also be ordered, and it shows a stereotypical snowstorm appearance or cluster of grapes representing enlarged cystic chorionic villi. Let's start with molar pregnancy, also called a hydatidiform mole, which is the most common type. This is a neoplasm arising from gestational tissue, basically a result of abnormalities in fertilization. 80% of these are benign, but they have the potential to develop into invasive moles, which are malignant, but we'll go over those next. So a molar pregnancy is classified as either complete or partial or incomplete. 
A complete mole develops from an egg with no DNA, fertilized by one or two sperm. It has a 46XX karyotype, with all the chromosomes coming from paternal origin. A complete mole has a higher risk of becoming malignant and developing into choriocarcinoma. Signs of a complete molar pregnancy include huge amounts of HCG, vaginal bleeding, symptoms of hyperthyroidism, and a uterus larger than expected for gestational age. Ultrasounds shows a snowstorm appearance or grape-like mass with no fetal parts seen and no heart rate. The other classification of molar pregnancy, a partial mole, develops from an egg that is fertilized by two sperm. It has a triploid karyotype, like 69XXX or 69XYY. There might be development of the fetus, but it is always malformed and never viable. Signs of a partial molar pregnancy include increased beta-HCG, but not as much as a complete mole. The uterus is not larger than expected, and most result in a spontaneous abortion. Ultrasound findings might include fetal parts in a gestational sac. While both complete and partial moles are benign, they are considered pre-malignant because they can develop into invasive moles. Treatment for both complete and partial moles is uterine evacuation by suction curatage. This is done as soon as possible to reduce choriocarcinoma risk and administer Rogam if indicated. Follow-up involves weekly serum beta-HCG levels until it falls to undetectable levels for three consecutive weeks. Then after that, serum HCG gets measured every month for six months. This is because a rise in HCG could indicate invasive mole or choriocarcinoma, so that's what we're monitoring for. Advise the patient to avoid pregnancy for one year after a molar pregnancy. So let's go through invasive moles next. They always develop from a molar pregnancy and are always malignant. They are also more common following a complete mole rather than a partial mole. Clinical signs of an invasive mole might include persistent abnormal uterine bleeding and a boggy uterus. The diagnosis is made when beta-HCG levels plateau or increase, or when they're still detectable up to six months after the evacuation. Diagnosis can be confirmed with an ultrasound, which will show anechoic areas with high vascular flow. Treatment is methotrexate as chemotherapy and or a hysterectomy. Choriocarcinoma can also develop after a molar pregnancy, more commonly a complete mole, but it can also develop after a non-molar pregnancy as well. Choriocarcinoma is a highly malignant epithelial tumor that can arise from any type of trophoblastic tissue, meaning any type of pregnancy, including ectopic pregnancy and abortion. Again, diagnosis is made when beta-HCG levels plateau or increase, and an ultrasound can help confirm the diagnosis. Ultrasound of choriocarcinoma will show a single mass distending the uterus with areas of necrosis and hemorrhage. Clinical symptoms can include abnormal uterine bleeding, pelvic pain or pressure, and signs of metastasis. For this reason, patients should get a head, abdomen, and pelvis CT and a chest x-ray in order to stage the tumor and look for metastasis. Stage 1 tumors are confined to the uterus. Stage 2 extend to the fallopian tubes, ovaries, or vagina. Stage 3 have mets to the lungs and stage 4 tumors have metastasis to any other organ besides the lungs or reproductive structures. Treatment of choriocarcinoma is surgical resection and methotrexate, or combined chemotherapy. Lastly, a placental site trophoblastic tumor is a rare, potentially malignant neoplasm that originates from intermediate trophoblast cells. They can occur months to years after a pregnancy, and only about 30% are malignant, while the rest are benign. However, they tend to be resistant to chemotherapy, so patients with non-metastatic tumors are generally treated with a hysterectomy. Local resection is also possible if the patient wants to preserve fertility. If the tumor is metastatic, treatment is surgical with chemotherapy. And that brings us to the last topic in this section, ectopic pregnancy. This is the implantation of a fertilized egg somewhere other than the uterus. In about 98% of ectopic pregnancies, the implantation site is within the fallopian tube, most commonly the ampulla, often due to occlusion of the tube from adhesions. 
Other potential sites are the ovary, cervix, or even abdomen. Risk factors for ectopic pregnancy include pelvic inflammatory disease, previous abdominal or tubal surgeries, history of tubal ligation, endometriosis, IUD use, assisted reproduction, and previous ectopic pregnancy. The classic triad to remember for ectopic pregnancy is unilateral pelvic or abdominal pain, vaginal bleeding, and pregnancy, or amenorrhea. Cervical motion tenderness or an adnexal mass might be present as well. If it's a ruptured or rupturing ectopic pregnancy, there might be severe abdominal or shoulder pain, peritonitis, nausea and vomiting, and signs of hemorrhagic shock like tachycardia, hypotension, and syncope. Ruptured ectopic pregnancy is a true medical emergency. Diagnosis is made with serial quantitative beta-HCG and a transvaginal ultrasound. The HCG should double every 24 to 48 hours in a normal pregnancy, but it won't increase this much in an ectopic, and it might even plateau or decrease. Ultrasound can confirm the presence or absence of pregnancy within the uterus. When beta-HCG is more than 2,000, but there is no gestational sac on ultrasound, it strongly suggests ectopic. Treatment of an unruptured ectopic pregnancy is methotrexate. If the patient is hemodynamically stable, in early gestation with beta-HCG less than 5,000, and no fetal heart tones, then methotrexate is given to destroy the trophoblastic tissue. If there's a contraindication to methotrexate, a laparoscopic salpingostomy or salpingectomy can be done. If the patient is unstable or has a ruptured ectopic pregnancy, first-line treatment is laparoscopic salpingostomy to remove the ectopic tissue. In this procedure, a hole is created in the fallopian tube in order to access the ectopic gestation. So sometimes a reparative procedure is needed to save reproductive organs afterwards. A salpingectomy, or removal of the fallopian tube, is an option too, as is a laparotomy in severe cases. And remember to administer Rogam when indicated. The next section is labor and delivery complications, beginning with fetal distress. The well-being of baby is monitored by fetal heart rate, so a Doppler ultrasound is assessed at almost every prenatal visit. Normal fetal heart rate is between 120 and 160 beats per minute. If it's higher than 60 for more than 10 minutes, it's considered fetal tachycardia. And if it's below 120 for more than 10 minutes, it's considered bradycardia. A non-stress test, NST, can be done as well to record fetal heart rate along with fetal movement. A healthy reactive NST will have two accelerations in a 20-minute time period. And these accelerations are defined as an increase in fetal heart rate of at least 15 beats per minute for at least 15 seconds. Anything less than two accelerations, or even fetal decelerations, is a non-reactive NST. It's possible that baby is just asleep, so vibroacoustic simulation can be done, and then repeat the NST. But if that fails, a contraction stress test can be done. This is similar to an NST, but uterine contractions are induced, often using a low dose of oxytocin, in order to measure fetal response to contractions. An acceptable or negative contraction stress test will have no late decelerations or significant variable decelerations in the presence of two contractions in 10 minutes. A positive contraction stress test will have repetitive late decelerations and it indicates fetal distress. Prompt delivery is recommended at this point. And don't forget the acronym for remembering fetal heart rate tracings is VEAL-CHOP. The next topic is premature rupture of membranes, commonly referred to as PROM. This is defined as the rupture of membranes at 37 weeks gestation or later, but prior to the start of uterine contractions. Now, PPROM, or preterm premature rupture of membranes, is when the membranes rupture before 37 weeks gestation. Risk factors of PROM are smoking, STDs, prior preterm deliveries, and multiple gestations. So the patient will present with a sudden gush of clear or pale yellow fluid from the vagina. Diagnosis is made by confirming that this fluid is in fact amniotic fluid. First, on speculum exam, you'll see pooling of secretions. 
then a nitrazine and or fern test can confirm its amniotic fluid. A nitrazine paper test will turn blue if the pH of the fluid is greater than 6.5, meaning that PROM is likely. And under a microscope, the fluid will develop a fern pattern when it air dries. This ferning is the crystallization of the amniotic fluid, a positive fern test. The major complications associated with premature rupture of membranes are infection, like endometritis, and umbilical cord prolapse. So treatment involves hospitalization and induction of labor, depending on the gestational age. For PROM, meaning that the patient is at 37 weeks or more, simply await spontaneous labor. For P-PROM, induce labor if the pregnancy is greater than 34 weeks. If it's less than 34 weeks, assess fetal lung development, consider steroids and antibiotics, and then induce. A prolapsed umbilical cord occurs when the umbilical cord comes out of the uterus prior to or with the baby. This is an obstetric emergency. If the cord is compressed too much or for too long, it can lead to fetal hypoxia, brain damage, or death. In fact, the first sign of a prolapsed cord is a sudden and severe decrease in fetal heart rate that persists. Remember that veal chop acronym? V is variable deceleration, and it lines up with C, which is cord compression. Well, on fetal heart rate tracing, this would look like a moderate to severe variable deceleration. This is an emergency, and treatment is immediate C-section. Prior to the C-section, sometimes it's also necessary to manually elevate the presenting fetal part up off of the prolapsed umbilical cord, and maybe place mom in a knee chest position as well. Preterm labor is defined as the delivery of a viable infant before 37 weeks gestation. Risk factors include smoking, cocaine use, incompetent cervix, infection, uterine malformations, and low pregnancy weight. Remember that labor is described as regular uterine contractions with progressive cervical changes, meaning dilation and effacement of the cervix. If you're uncertain about the diagnosis, assess the cervix. If it's 2 to 3 centimeters dilated and or more than 80% effaced, this indicates labor. Speculum exam might show pooling of vaginal fluid from the rupture of membranes, and you can use the nitrazine pH paper test or the ferning test to confirm that that fluid is amniotic fluid. Also, fetal fibronectin can be assessed in vaginal secretions. Fetal fibronectin is the most clinically useful test to determine whether a woman is at risk for preterm delivery. Presence of this protein between 20 and 34 weeks gestation with labor symptoms strongly suggests preterm labor. Once a diagnosis is determined, it's important to rule out infections like UTI and group B strep and to assess fetal lung development. The earlier a baby is born, the greater the risk of health complications, especially within the respiratory system. Treatment should start with hospital admission and assessment for infections. Steroids like betamethasone should be given to enhance fetal lung development, and tocolytics should be administered to relax the uterus and suppress contractions. These tocolytics are generally only given for 24 to 48 hours, though, so that the steroids can take effect on the baby. They rarely delay delivery more than 48 hours. Other drugs can delay delivery for longer, but also have more side effects. Some of these meds are indomethacin, calcium channel blockers like nifedipine, and beta agonists like terbutaline. Lastly, if an intrauterine infection is present, antibiotics should be started and delivery should not be delayed. The next topic is breech birth. Remember, the ideal fetal position is head down, face down, meaning the baby's face is to mom's back, with a longitudinal lie and fetal chin tucked to chest. When baby is not head first, this is called breech presentation. And about 3-5% to of term pregnancies are breech. There are a few different types to go through. Complete, incomplete, frank, and shoulder. Complete breach occurs when fetal hips and knees are both flexed, so baby's butt presents first. Incomplete breach occurs when one or both hips are not completely flexed, so a foot presents first. This is also called a footling, kind of cute. Frank breach is when both hips are flexed, but both knees are extended straight. So baby is butt first again. And shoulder presentation occurs when the baby has a transverse lie, leading to a shoulder presenting first. 
Diagnosis is based on physical exam but can be confirmed with ultrasound. If the patient is at or near term, an external cephalic version can be tried, where the provider manually manipulates the fetal position by pushing on the mother's abdomen. This is not a gentle procedure, by the way. And it's not always successful or possible, so depending on the stage of labor, a C-section delivery should be considered. Labor dystocia, or obstructed labor, is defined as abnormal labor progression. This can cause fetal distress and hypoxia, as well as risk of maternal infection, uterine rupture, and postpartum bleeding. The most common causes of dystocia include a small maternal pelvis, poor contractions, and fetal macrosomia. There are three categories of dystocia. Problems of power, like uterine contractions. Problems of passenger, meaning fetal size or position. And problems of passage through the birth canal. One common type of passenger-associated dystocia is shoulder dystocia. This occurs when one or both fetal shoulders are lodged at the pubic symphysis after delivery of the head, and it might present with turtle sign, which is retraction of the delivered fetal head towards mom. Shoulder dystocia can be managed with McRoberts maneuver, which is hyperflexion of the maternal hips and knees followed by application of suprapubic pressure. Wood's corkscrew maneuver is another option, and this involves rotation of the fetal shoulders 180 degrees. And if these are unsuccessful, a C-section might be required. Treatment of abnormal progression of labor depends on the stage and whether it's caused by power, passenger, or passage. For a prolonged latent stage, ambulation is often suggested. For a prolonged active stage, oxytocin can be given to increase power of uterine contractions. For a rest of the active stage, oxytocin can be given if power is the problem, or a C-section might be indicated if the problem is the passenger or birth canal. For a prolonged second stage, oxytocin can be given for power, or a vacuum extraction can be done. Sometimes C-section is necessary. For a prolonged third stage, when the baby is out and we're awaiting the placenta, uterine massage, oxytocin, and manual extraction are the treatment options. Postpartum hemorrhage is significant blood loss after giving birth, defined by more than 500 milliliters if by vaginal delivery, and more than one liter if by C-section. This is the most common cause of maternal death. Risk factors include either rapid or prolonged labor and overdistended uterus. Also, C-sections carry more risk of hemorrhage than vaginal deliveries. The most common etiologies of postpartum hemorrhage can be remembered as the four T's, Tone, trauma, tissue, and thrombin. About 90% of postpartum hemorrhage is caused by tone, or uterine atony, defined as a boggy and enlarged uterus that is unable to contract to stop the bleeding. Trauma was the next T, and this refers to any trauma sustained to the genital tract. It can be brought on by precipitous labor or operative vaginal delivery, like the use of forceps or vacuum extraction. Tissue is next, and this refers to retained placental tissue within the uterus. This is also an infection risk. And the last one was thrombin, meaning coagulation disorders that prevent blood clots from forming. Examples include von Willebrand's disease or preeclampsia, which can lead to DIC. So the four T's of postpartum hemorrhage again are tone, trauma, tissue, and thrombin. Patients might present with signs of hypovolemic shock or low hemoglobin and hematocrit on a CBC. Ultrasound can be used to detect bleeding if the source is unknown, but as we said, uterine atony is the most common cause. It can usually be managed with fundal massage or medications like oxytocin or misoprostol to encourage the uterus to contract. By the way, this is not a nice, gentle uterine massage. It's pretty firm pressure to the fundus of the uterus through the abdomen, often with counterpressure intravaginally as well. A hysterectomy might be a last resort in severe cases, too. So for vaginal bleeding secondary to trauma, lacerations longer than 2 centimeters require surgical repair. For retained placental tissue, a manual extraction or a suction and curatage might be required, and antibiotics should be considered due to the risk of infection, like endometritis. And lastly, for postpartum hemorrhage secondary to coagulation disorders, a hematologist should be consulted. Endometritis is next. This is an infection of the inner lining of the uterus called the endometrium. 
Endometritis can occur from childbirth, gynecologic procedures, and IUD contraceptive devices. It's the most common type of infection after childbirth and is usually polymicrobial. C-section is the biggest risk factor, but others include prolonged rupture of membranes, STDs, and DNCs. Symptoms include fever, tachycardia, lower abdominal pain, and abnormal vaginal bleeding or discharge. The patient is often two to three days post-C-section or post-abortion. Endometritis is primarily a clinical diagnosis. An endometrial biopsy can confirm the diagnosis, but this isn't routinely done. Treatment is antibiotics, and typically first line is a clindamycin and gentamicin combo. Ampicillin can be added for additional group B strep coverage, and ampicillin plus sulbactam is an alternative combo. The next topic is perineal laceration and episiotomy care. Episiotomies are not routinely done anymore, as a lot of providers find that it's better for the mother to tear naturally and then repair that laceration. Tears are very common, and they're classified into four categories. A first-degree tear crosses the perineal skin and vaginal mucosa. A second degree involves injury to the perineal body. Third degree passes through the external anal sphincter. And fourth degree involves injury to the rectal mucosa. There are two treatment options. Either let the tear heal naturally or surgically repair it. Third and fourth degree tears typically require surgical repair. And most women who sustain a third or fourth degree tear are asymptomatic a year later. But some experience fecal incontinence, fecal urgency, chronic perineal pain, pain with intercourse, and fistula formation. Postpartum refers to the six-week period following delivery when the body returns to a non-pregnant state, and there are a few major changes to mention here before we wrap up the study guide. After delivery, the uterus is at the level of the umbilicus. Involution or shrinking occurs over the next few days, and by the end of the first week postpartum, it will have decreased to the size of a 12-week gestation and is palpable at the pubic symphysis. The uterus is normally back to normal size around six weeks postpartum. Normal postpartum discharge begins as lochia rubra, meaning red, and contains blood and shreds of tissue. The amount of this discharge tapers and it changes to a pinkish-brown color after the first three to four days. This pinkish-brown discharge is called lochia serosa, and it lasts for about another week. Finally, during the second week, the discharge changes to a light brown or a yellowish-white color, and it's called lochia alba. This discharge lasts for another few weeks. Finally, ovulation occurs again as early as 27 days after delivery, but on average it's about 70 to 75 days in non-lactating women and 6 months in lactating women. These numbers can vary widely, though. And with that, we're done. This wraps up the obstetrics half of the Women's Health EOR exam study guide. The gynecology video, the other half of the PAEA topic list for the Women's Health exam, is up on my channel, but I'll link it below as well. The Family Medicine Review Guide is being edited now and will be up next, so stay tuned, subscribe if you like, and thank you so much for listening. Happy studying, and I'll see you in the next video.